Hi everyone and welcome to another episode of Get Cooked. My name's Sarah Cook and each week I've been bringing you the stories and guests from in our own community both here in Australia and overseas and today is the very last episode and I'm absolutely delighted that I can spend it with the one and only Catherine Ross. She's a three-time Paralympian, Paralympic silver medalist, four-time world champion and current world best time holder in the PR2 women's single scale. Kat, I don't know if there's much more you could add to that. Welcome, thank you for joining me. Thanks for having me. Now, this week on Monday, it marked one year to go to the Tokyo Paralympic Games. Can you tell us how your training is going and what your aspirations are for games next year? Well, training has been, of course, quite challenging over the last uh, little while, um, slowly getting back into it. Um, I did have some much needed time off. I did have a, a week off completely, uh, work and training and everything, which was really good leading in. Um, and this week marked my full week back uh, solid training. So, it's, you know, it feels like, OK, it's a one year to go. This is the start. Let's let's really put the roots down on it and go hard and see what happens. So we're pretty excited, but still uh, a bit of a challenge to go. Definitely. And and how did you cope, I guess, with, with the, the goalposts moving like that by a year? Yeah, it was quite challenging because, you know, you have your mindset and you have your goals and you literally have your life planned out, uh, work and et cetera. But um, it kind of gave me... I was stuck in two minds really with it. I was stuck in the times of, you know, this is terrible. We've got to, how do I keep going for another year? Put my body through all this, the mind, everything. And then the other half of me is like, hang on, you've got a year, another year to go. Let's see what you can do. You've, or you've stepped up this far. Let's see how further you can go for a year, um, you know, and, and run with it and see it's giving you an opportunity. Yeah, that's great to hear. And, and I can imagine on a day-to-day -day basis, flipping between those two thoughts. But great that you're able to see, I guess, that silver lining and the opportunity, like so many of our athletes that I've spoken to have been able to find. And I think that's one of the strengths um, of athletes is being adaptable and being able to find the opportunity, even in, uh, I guess, these unprecedented and, and really unfortunate times. Yeah, correct. I mean, we can only control what we can control. Um, and, you know, that's myself and my surroundings. And, you know, unfortunately, I can't fix the pandemic. I wish I could for everybody. That'd be, you know, press a button on that. Um, but I've got to roll with what's happening as much as I can, um, it, you know, and just like everybody else, you have to find the positive in what you're doing. Otherwise, you know, it's, I don't know how you would keep going it would be very, very difficult. If you didn't find something good in, in all of this, um, it would be pretty dark times, I think. Absolutely. Such a great um, mentality and, and amazing to hear from you. And, and I think that'll stand you in good stead over the challenges to come over the next month, uh, 12 months. Now, Kat, I want to, um, I guess, go back. And can you tell us a little bit about, I, I guess, your accident and how you acquired your impairment? Yeah, my, my injury is not a real common one. And, and when people go, oh, what's, what's your disability? You know, I don't actually have a name for it like, like some. Um, I was unfortunately ran over when I was two and a half years of age by a lawnmower on our farm. Um, you know, wrong place, wrong time. My father didn't know I was outside playing um, and accidentally backed over me with the lawnmower. And it was actually Father's Day morning, so just to put that stamp on Dad. But um, <laughs> unfortunately, you know, things happened. And um, I've learned to grow with it. I've had a lot of challenges throughout my life with it. I've you know, had a lot of experimental surgeries done because it was quite an unusual um, accident. And a lot of surgeons back in the 80s hadn't seen the, the challenges that it was going to present. So, um again I had to I had to roll with what I had growing up and um, I was lucky I had a family who didn't treat me any different um, you know I, there was a bit of tough love going on there <laughs> you know I think it put me through some good stead for, for everything yeah it's it's been one of those those challenges and it'll always be a challenge going forward um, with the with my leg um, because of the accident it caused quite a fair bit of like deformity to the knee and to the ankle. And while growing up, it was a challenge to try and keep my leg and save my leg. Um, 
sometimes I question nowadays if that was the right decision, but you know, they do say you're better off with what you have. Um, can be debatable nowadays. Prosthetics are brilliant <laughs> these days as we, as we mm. seen, especially in the Paralympics when you go, it's like amazing. Um, but back in the eighties, you know, my parents were given the advice back then and that's what they ran with. And, and, you know, we've made the best of what we can. It's incredible to hear uh, your perspective um, on, you know, what, what could have been a really, you know, negative um, situation for you. And, and I certainly don't belittle how difficult some of those times must have been throughout your life, but incredible to hear your perspective on that now. And, and uh, you're open in, in talking about it. And, and I'd like you to maybe to tell us why it's important to be open and talking to people about living with an impairment and, and engaging in that conversation. Oh, I, yeah, I'm, I'm very big in open talking about, uh, you know, my impairment. And I'm probably a bit nosy asking about other people. Um, but people are inquisitive and, and I always believe knowledge is power. Um, people can't judge you if they don't have the right information. I mean, they can judge you, but they can uh, put you in the right light if they have the right information about you. And, you know, I, I don't believe anyone should be you know, shunned and put in a corner and forgotten about just because they're a little bit different. Um, we have, it, you know, challenges and experiences and everything that we can uh, dispose upon anybody else that, you know, if they just wanted to listen and, and find out. I find children are the most inquisitive. Um, we'll ask straight out, <laughs> no questions asked, you know, what's wrong with you? <laughs> and, and <laughs> You know, it's parents become very, oh, you can't ask that. And it's like, well, actually they can. Like, why not? And then, then you know, and, and kids don't judge after that. Like, kids, kids just want to know information. And, and I think it's a big thing that adults should take on as well. Um, we should all talk about it. It's gone are the days where people uh, with disabilities were put behind closed doors. It should never have happened. And, uh, you know, we can all grow from what we can see and learn from. Absolutely. I remember this really sweet moment on one of our um, tours because obviously you and I were on the team together for many years and at the AIS together for many years and Larissa Biesenthal, who was um, my coach for, for a couple of years at AIS, she had two really young daughters, as you'd remember, Avery and Riley. And um, I remember Riley on our first tour uh, together was, was maybe a couple of years old and she came up to one of the power rowers who had a prosthetic and, and touched it and went, Ooh, ouch. And Larissa was sort of mortified, but uh, you know, the rower was, was like, no, no, it's okay. I'm, you know, yes, yes, it, it did hurt. And I'm happy to talk about it. You know, so it, it's amazing when you see um, kids and, and their inquisitive nature. Um, yeah. It was a really sweet moment that stuck with me. Yeah. It, it's, I, I kind of remember that um, situation happening and, and um, yeah, they were, they were wonderful having on board um, open conversations for people. Um, we, it's, it's interesting as a society, we're just, uh, what's the word? Not, not afraid, but it's a bit taboo to sort of speak about something that's different or find out or, you know, and, and it's good that those doors are all opening now and we're able to talk and see about those things. And I think, you know, we can learn a lot from children as well along the way. Absolutely. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think, you know, sometimes that trepidation might come from people not knowing what's appropriate or what questions to ask so I think having conversations like this where we're open and we're honest and, and hearing from you and your perspectives is so important to that to that learning for everyone yeah oh, 100 percent. I mean my accident when it happened in 1983 um, was horrific and horrific for my yeah. parents and they even have said to me um, while I was growing up it was it was a challenge more with with adults and um, say teachers at school um, mm. to not treat me differently, to not make me special or, um, you know, put me aside because I, she, she won't be able to do that. I do remember in primary school, I think I went to the same dinosaur park excursion for like four years running because the teachers <laughs> were too afraid to take me on anything else that they didn't know was unfamiliar or, you know, so I missed out on a lot of things while growing up. But um, 
you know, when my mum approached the subject with the teachers, they're like, oh, oh, we don't know how to manage Catherine's disability. And it's like, what do you got to manage? Mum's like, she don't have to manage anything. She will join in. She will do what she can. Don't, she doesn't need to be excluded. Um, and it took a lot for my parents to push that quite a lot over the years. Um, and I'm glad that they did. Yeah. Absolutely. Incredible strength um, from, from them in, in, I guess, managing that and the expectations of other people. So, yeah, it's quite a remarkable story. Um, now, I want to go to how you found the sport of rowing, Kat. How did you, how did you find yourself in a rowing boat? Mm, it's quite a question. A long, interesting kind of story. Um, at the time, uh, I was living in England. I was nannying. And I fell and I fell down some stairs and, and I actually shattered my knee and I had oh, to come wow. home and see the specialist. And um, I, <laughs> he said, just to get back in doing rehab and everything. So I was doing a lot of swimming and I love swimming. And, and that was always a big source of rehab for me growing all, up all of my life, all through my surgeries and everything. It was like, get back in the pool. So I've been swimming from quite a young age and loved it. And I was doing uh, open water competition swimming at the time down in Southwest Victoria and loved it. And I, you swam in your age groups. And at the time I was in my twenties <laughs> and I was doing really well. And I came top six in the state at that time. Um, and someone had said, Oh, what about the Paralympics? And I, I, I kind of dismissed it straight away because I was very naive in the fact of, I said, oh, well, I can't go on the Paralympics. I'm not in a wheelchair. And that was the concept that I had. I had no yeah. idea about it. I, it like, my mum used to watch it um, while growing up and things like that. And she loves the games. Like, absolutely. She used to collect the posters and everything of all the games. And um, But I, I was never exposed to it. And I don't think she had ever thought of it either. Um, because there was that concept of you have to be in a wheelchair to go on the Paralympics, but finding out that wasn't the cause. So um, I then was doing the swimming and someone had mentioned the Paralympics. So I got in contact with the APC at the time, Australian Paralympic Committee, and they said, head along to a talent day and we'll have a look at you. So I went along um, <laughs> and they tested me in multiple sports. So there was swimming and basketball, tennis, athletics and rowing. And at the time, they said, oh, you're quite good at swimming, um, but you also got talent in rowing and tennis. And at this stage, Beijing was only 18 months away. Wow. And I was never very good at sticking with anything for too long. So I was like, oh. And they said, swimming, you can make London games at the time. And I was like, oh, that's too far away. Like, <laughs> yeah, doubt I'd stick with it for that long. And then so I said, all right, um, which one of these ones do you recommend? And they said, well, uh, the rowing or the tennis would be your best bets to go to Beijing. These are where your talents lie. And at the time I was like, rowing, what? That's like the dumbest sport ever. Like you go backwards, like who would <laughs> want to do that? And they just looked at me and went, well, you know, rowing's where your talent is and, and tennis. And I said, all right. I said, this is the goal. I'm going to go to Beijing. And they said, well, hold up. It might take a bit longer than that. It does, you know, it takes a long time to become a Paralympian or Olympian. And I said, I oh, obviously no. didn't know you very well. <laughs> no, I think it was quite interesting because they were like, no, it does. It takes a long time. And I'm like, no, nah, no, nah, she's right. I'm going to go tell me what I need to do to get here. And, and that's what I'm going to do. And um, I think they were, they were quite dubious about it. And they said, all right, this is what you need to do. So I teed up with a coach. Um, hit all the targets that needed to do, like the states and the nationals and then head to trials and, and things like that. And um, it, it was quite a journey getting from, say, when I started rowing to the first world championships. Uh, it was eight months I'd been rowing. Wow. Um, and I came um, second in the... We got second there and was able to qualify for Beijing. Little did I know I had to do that whole thing again all the qualifications, all the setup, everything. And that was hard work <laughs> and to go through it all again. But then hitting Beijing, um, you know, I was in, in great spirits. It was great shape. I was so determined and, you know, uh, teed up with um, John McLean, 
and he was a great athlete at the time. Little did I know that I had to team up as a pair, as a, as a double, as a second person. Um, at the time, I said he'd want to be good at what he does. <laughs> Later, I found out he's pretty good. Sounds pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> he was pretty good. And we made a great team. And we actually, you know, we, we got silver in Beijing. So um, within the 18 months, um, you know, I, I won a silver at the Paralympic Games. I missed gold by 0.8 of a second. Amazing. So close. Um, most exciting thing ever. Um, but, you know, it went from zero to crazy real quick. But I was pretty determined right through. That's incredible because your story is actually a little bit reversed to many of my other guests who started out in the sport and then at some point along the journey, they thought, oh, I might like to go to the Olympics or, or row for Australia. But for you, the catalyst was, I want to compete for Australia at the Paralympic Games. Show me how and where I'm going to do it and, and let me have at it. Yep. Yep. Give me the guidance of what, what I need to do, what targets I need to hit and, and how to get there and, and I'll get there. And it was interesting because those guys that did the talent search uh, were there and were standing up. And I remember looking up from, from oh, wow. the up and they were just like, that's just crazy. How does this happen? Yeah, it was that's amazing. Some, that's so amazing. So yeah. amazing. It was all meant to be, obviously. Um, but you rode, as you said, with John McLean in Beijing, won the silver medal. You then partnered up with Gavin Bellis, um, who you competed with in 2012 and 2016, and you won three world championships together along the way. Can you tell us a little bit, I guess, about how, you, how those partnerships came about, how you found them, and what you think the keys are to a successful partnership in rowing? Oh, well, a lot of it, um, teaming up with, with uh, Gav and John and, and a couple of the others along the way, you know, is a lot driven from um, teamwork with Rowing Australia and um, Paralympics Australia. And, um, you know, you sort of get your guidance that way for your partner. And, and, and it's interesting when I first met Gav, he was trialling uh, as a category above um but with his condition when I saw him I went he I don't think he's in the right class and mm. as time went on it, it found that he wasn't and um I remember getting in the boat with him the first time and I just knew it just we clicked yeah. straight away everything just molded well we had this utmost respect for each other and communication and and enjoyment for the sport in in what we were doing and it's interesting how everything just works and it was easy. Um, and, you know, the first time we actually had a proper race together, we, we broke the record in Gavarate. Wow. And it was, I don't know, it was just, it just worked. Everything just fell into place perfectly where it was meant to. It's funny talking to a few other rowers, including Rob Scott last week, where he and David Waitman got into a pair just for a photo shoot. They normally row the same side and, and they got in and they knew within about three or four strokes, hang on, this feels pretty good. So it's, it's amazing to hear that theme emerging from everyone who I talk to who has these really successful um, partnerships in the sport, that there is a little bit of, of magic, a little bit of something extra that comes when you find that perfect partnership, isn't there? Oh, 100%, 100%. I mean, I had something similar with John. Um, uh, I only had a short time with, with John due to retirement. Uh, but for, for some reason with Gav, it just gelled really, really well. And it was like, here we go. It, it, it's just amazing. So you won the World Championships in the PR2 women's single scale last year. Of course, that's not a Paralympic event. Can you tell us what your plans are leading up to Tokyo? Because you, you need to find a double partner, don't you? Yeah, I mean, after after Rio, um, Gav actually retired and um, I was a bit lost. I didn't know what to do. I'm like, I'll never, to me, I found I'll never find another person that will work with so well. Um, and I ended up having um, surgery on my legs. I was in quite a lot of pain leading into Rio and, and something needed to be done. So I took this opportunity to take a step back and work on myself a bit. And there was talk in the wind that there might've been a single event coming up um, mm -hmm. in World Champs. And it didn't eventuate straight away. 
Um, but I remember getting a phone call from, uh, from Gordon and Mark saying, guess what, they're bringing the single in, are you interested? And I said, yes, I'm interested, but I'm going into surgery next week. So yeah, it well. kind of fell into a timeline of, you know, um, it was time to work on me, but it was also giving me then also a glimpse of like, okay, post this surgery, I can do something for myself as well in the boat and prove my own abilities uh, in the world of sport, in the sport of rowing, of course. And um, that was exciting. So that drove me through with my rehab to stay on top and really work hard to get back to where I wanted to be and needed to be. So I, you know, initially took a couple of, couple of years out from Rio. Um, I was at some point throughout that time unsure if I would come back. Um, and I think in the back of my mind, I was hoping and pushing that they would have brought, brought it um, into the games as a single event, but still not, it hasn't come eventuated through to that just yet. So who, who's the lucky person? Who's going to be in a double with you next year? Do you know that yet? Or is there a process to go through to, to find it? It's still a process. Um, you know, I had a lot of conversations with Gav along the way. Um, and he got to a point in his life where he sort of needed something as well. And I said, mm. you know, mate, like, why not? Let's, let's give it another chance. Let's give it another shot. Let's see what we can do. Um, so I know, you know, he's, he's there trialling away in, in the background. Yeah, it's fantastic. But we've also got, you know, there's another gentleman in South Australia and he's coming along fantastically. Like he's, he's an amazing um, defeat of a guy. Like he's a double, double leg amputee, which in yeah. itself is crazy. Um, but he's, he's going really, really well and he's got a good support team there. So he's trialling as well. So there's a few people around in the, in the system. Um, which is really exciting because um, we don't usually have a lot, and uh, you know we'll see we'll see what happens at trials if we can we can get there. Oh, that's really exciting to hear that you've got a couple of prospects wow. anyway, and and amazing to hear that Gav might be back as well. Yes. Yeah. Now, Kat. Yeah, he's he's awesome. Love Gav. He was obviously we're on the team together for many years. So I was very excited when I did see a sneaky Facebook post a little while back hinting that he might be coming out of retirement. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we tried to keep it a little bit low because, <laughs> you know, we weren't 100% sure if he was going to be able to do it with his condition, uh, which is, has deteriorated slightly. And, um, you know, we're not sure how that will pan out. Uh, my thing is, it's just exciting to be able to maybe have the, a chance to row with him again and um, finish this journey off, hopefully, yeah. on a high. So, Kat, on Wednesday, Rising Phoenix premiered on Netflix, which is a documentary that examines how para-athletes uh, and the Paralympic Games impact a global understanding of diversity, disability and excellence. Why do you think that's such an important vehicle for this? I think it's a very exciting um, documentary that's come out. I mean, it's long in anticipated. I wish something like this was out when I was younger to, to be able to see, you know, that you can do anything you put your mind to. There are no boundaries. There are no <laughs> limits. The only limits are yourself. Um, and if you let other people limit you, that's, that's a barrier. And I think this opens up a channel for people to talk and to see and, be excited about something different. Um, you know, the Paralympics, it's such a movement and it's an exciting movement and you feel like a, a huge community. Um, and I mean, it's, I shouldn't, it's something that I never thought I would um, ever think of or, or experience. I remember the first regatta I ever went to, the rowing regatta, it was in the Gambia in, Vic, in Melbourne, Victoria. And I never actually, I tried to never ever see myself different from anybody else. But when I went there and I was amongst the other para-athletes, I felt this sense of belonging, um, this sense of, hang on, I, I, I felt normal around these people. Um, they didn't judge me for anything. They didn't see me as anything different. And I, it just felt like an amazing community that I'd been missing out on. And it's it's exciting to be a part of and I wish I'd had that growing up. And, and I think this vehicle 
um, an exciting documentary will give that to a lot of people coming, uh, you know, even through this COVID area of, um, you know, self-belief and, you know, can-do attitude and just excitement and quality that we are completely diverse. Uh, there is not one injury or condition that is is the same. You have no you know, have a wide range of cerebral palsy at the games. There's not one that's the same. And, you know, we, we rise and drive against what we have um, to be the best at what we can be um, personally, globally, nationally, everything. It's, it's, you know, I think this Rising Phoenix is, is very exciting. Um, and I think it's the beginning. Absolutely. And, and I don't know if people have seen even just the trailer, uh, it, it does give you give you chills, um, not only, you know, hearing from from the athletes themselves and hearing their voices. Um, but to, you know, to understand how important sport is and, and I guess what a unifier it is globally. It doesn't matter if you um, have an impairment or, or where you come from or who you are. Sport is something that is a global unifier. And I think that the Paralympic Games are such a celebration of that and and even hearing you talk about it now gets me you know emotional and excited hearing about it yeah i mean i never thought sport would have gotten me uh, to where i am today um the feeling of inclusion and the, and the feeling that i can make a difference to someone else's life um you know it, it's opened up it's hard to explain because it's opened up such a channel uh in myself and what i can what i see globally it's it's very exciting that i'd be able to maybe change someone else's life and show them that they can do and it doesn't have to be with sport it can be with music it can be academia it could be anything um that your heart desires just because you have a disability doesn't mean that you can't do anything absolutely and you're such an incredible role model for that and and such an inspiration and and I guess for anyone who's watching or, or who might come across this, who might be interested in getting to para rowing and giving it a go, what advice would you give to them? Oh, gosh, don't be afraid. <laughs> um, have a go, have a crack. Um, tap in with local clubs. Um, I mean, you could do the whole hog and ring up the Australian Paralympic Committee and just knock on their door straight away um there's those channels as well um, find out when when uh talent days are about and go see what your talents are and where you might lie or you know i swimming was my goal swimming was what i wanted to do and i loved it i love it so much but little did i know that that was that was just a, a channel way through to something better that i never knew was even there like it will open doors so much get in touch with your states, state bodies, uh, you know, ACT rowing or rowing Victoria or Queensland, you know, touch base, um, even um, contact um, the, high, the head uh, coach in para rowing, Gordon Marks, he'll be able to, to channel you to the area where you are, like in your state and, and what clubs are affiliated with para rowing and, you know, there's not enough of those. Uh, we're, we're hoping to, you know, drive that a little bit more and make it more inclusive because people are, you know, we have found some clubs are afraid. Oh, I don't know how to coach a para athlete. Um, you know, it, and it's it's those barriers. And, that, and that's not the barrier against the athlete. It's, it's a barrier against, you know, the club not wanting to open their, their arms and their eyes a bit to hang on. Then actually we don't row that but that different our boat size is a little bit different but generally we don't row too differently that you know the same techniques are sort of there the aspects um you know try and teach us like a, a able body rower just tweak it along the way um don't be afraid so yeah it's more of get out there see see who will uh who will um have a go who will take you on great advice get out there give it a go Get in touch with Gordon Marks, as you say, the the head ca head coach and, and coordinator for para rowing nationally. Um, otherwise, state institutes or, or the APC um, directly. So, some great advice there, Cad, and also to clubs. Rowing is rowing, and and that's what we're all here to to do and and be a part of. 
Now, aside from being an elite athlete, you have a dual career as a nurse. Can you tell us a little bit about that and the importance for you of having that balance in your life? Yeah, I, while growing up having different surgeries throughout my life, in and out of hospital, uh, a lot of hospitals, <laughs> I had some really amazing nurses uh, that stuck in my mind. And, um, you know, a couple of them actually made a difference in my life. Um, and as I grew up, I was like, I want to be one of them. I want to be someone that can make a change, make a difference in someone's life, make a positive impact. Um, and little did I know it was going to be a bit of a challenge, <laughs> try to be a nurse. Um, you know, while, while going through, I was actually, re uh, you know, rejected from two universities to study nursing because they said I was not employable. And what? yes, <laughs> I've had a lot of challenges along the way. Oh, and, and this is, yeah, yes. And I, you don't think that happens these days, but it still happens. Um, they said that you have to be on your feet eight, 10, 12 hours a day. And I don't think you could do that. And Did I, you and say, um, I've been to the Paralympics and won a silver medal? I'm sorry. <laughs> yes. It's like, well, actually, you're just judging by faith. They actually Absolutely. didn't know me. They actually didn't know what I was capable of. Um, and, and, and that's a big thing. I believe that people should never judge someone on their abilities um, by visual. I mean, yeah. I know my capabilities. I know my abilities in every aspect of my life. And I reckon everybody does. And it should be up to them to say, no, that's something I, I cannot do or, you know, I put my hand up. I can't run. I wish I could, but you know, there's, there are the limits, but I know my limits. Um, but persevering when I moved up to Canberra, uh, went to UC and said, I, I want to be a nurse. I, I want to have a career post sport. And I'm very big on that. And they said, we'll take you. And there was no questions asked. So it was quite a, a difference from constantly being sort of knocked down a bit um, to then going, no, nah, we'll give you a chance. You'll know if you can do it or not. And um, yeah, so they supported me all through the sporting career. And um, I'm now currently a, a critical care nurse in the emergency department. Um, so it's pretty exciting. Exciting times at the moment. Uh, very yes. challenging. Um, but, you know, it's, it's great. I, I kind of have that work-life balance as best as I can. Um, and um, I'm, champ you know, making sure that I've got something post-sport that I can then drive into as well such an incredibly important message for all of our athletes and and people listening to be setting up for that that dual career as we call it as an athlete but also who am I outside of sport and, and what do I want to do and what will fulfill me and and where can I take those those lessons sorry uh, that I've learned uh, I guess in sport into a career and hearing a story about nursing that's uh, that is astounding like you say to hear that you know that kind of rejection and judgment happens even in you know today's situation is is quite unbelievable so all credit to you for pursuing and persisting with with that dream yeah it took a long time and uh i bet uh, and i thought maybe it might not happen but i was pretty driven on it and i i didn't want to you know be on my deathbed one day going if only and i wish i had if you know and i was like you know i'll i want to do it and then if it isn't for me at the finish line of that, then that's fine. But at least I did it. And at least I proved to myself that I could do it. Well, Kat, you don't strike me as someone who will have anything left in terms of regrets or a bucket list at the end of it, because you're absolutely a go-getter and an incredibly inspiring and driven person. And it's been such a pleasure hearing from you today. But we're going to finish up our interview with the Fast Five, which is the five questions we ask all of our guests. So let's get into it. Your favourite course to row on. Oh, without a doubt, uh, bled in Slovenia. Wow. Nothing can top that at this stage. It is like something from a Disney fairy tale. I tell people this when I explain it. It is the most extraordinary place. Yes, so I, I completely agree with you there. Oh, I mean, rowing down that course and you've got the Swiss Alps all around you and you've got a castle up on a, on a cliff and then a beautiful church on an island in the middle and you're rowing right in the middle of all of that. The, the view is spectacular the water is that beautiful beautiful blue crystal blue color and you know the community everyone there it's fantastic i mean i've been lucky enough to be there twice so. oh wow yeah 
Yeah, incredible place. Would love to go back there. Mm -hmm. All right, your top track to erg to. Ugh, who likes <laughs> ergs? Okay. Um, <laughs> to try and soften the burden on doing an erg. It's always good to have exactly. a good track. Um, I don't have lots of just a specific favourite, but at the moment I'm really digging that um, Roses by Immenbeck. Yep. It's got a great beat. Um, it pumps you up. Goes through about three and a half minutes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely fantastic to to work through on a on a good hard erg. If I'm prepping for like two k five k ergs, I really like to have that one going. Yep, I agree. I agree. It's about finding a playlist of the right songs that last the duration of, of a test. Sometimes, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, then you can get your mind through it going. Okay, I only got three more songs left. Like <laughs> whatever yep. gets you through. <laughs> I remember, I remember. Uh, the best piece of advice that you have been given? Oh, well, it actually came from um, John McClain. Yeah. Which is uh, a world of wisdom, that man. Um, and it was never be afraid to ask a question. And I used to be quite sort of shy, believe it or not. Um, and I used to be afraid of, if I asked the question, what would happen? What would, what would people think of me? All these kind of things. Um, so I used to, you know, never sort of ask a question and things like that. And he said, you know, what, what are you going to lose by asking a question? You won't, you know, you'll speculate, you'll... And I used to get worked up and get quite anxious and things like that, um, worrying about what, you know, I wanted to ask, but I was too afraid to ask because I was worried about the answer. And, yeah, his, his advice was ask a question what do you got to lose you can like people can only say no and then you know where you are yeah. and you can move on you can make other changes other decisions but if you don't ask the question you'll always stew on it you'll always go oh what if what if and um you, you know it, it has re, uh, relieved a lot of the anxiety that i used to have and and not worry about um what what people thought or things like that so he you know he dispose that on one on me so yeah that's that's great i think that fits with your theme of, of no regrets no what ifs so so that that's a great one uh your career highlight to date um i mean i've had a lot over yes this. yeah <laughs> and each <laughs> one has its own significant um meaning and experience and things like that but i i do believe it would have to be the world champs last year um coming back from surgery i wasn't sure how i was going to go i was in an event which was just me you haven't got that other person to rely on um you know sitting at a starting line gab always calmed my nerves i didn't have that person there i didn't have someone there to whisper in my ear we got this we got this and i just had to believe and trust in myself um and you know my coach renee she she always believes in what i my abilities as well uh probably sometimes more than what i question myself sometimes and um she goes you got this just go have a go have some fun and see how you go and um i didn't know i broke the world record at that time and that was so exciting and just to be able to have that stance as an individual um you know individual female para athlete on the world stage to say hey I did this and I did this on my own in the boat outside you have a huge team that does get you there and they and you will be nothing without them but sitting in, alone in that boat um you feel pretty pretty lonely and going this is I've got to do this it's just on me everybody else is riding on this um so I, I have to say just winning that world champ and breaking that record would have to be the highlight of so far my to date run career and I have got a lot of highlights so yeah be special no that's absolutely incredible and, and a very deserving one but like you say hard to pick one and and hopefully there's there's more to come as well mm -hmm. now this one is always an interesting one the hardest session you've ever done it is hard because some of them are very hard <laughs> and you try to get through them and then forget about them and hope that that never happens ever, ever again. <laughs> um, for me, I have a couple of different ones. One of the hardest ones was in the gym, uh, gym training uh, with my coach at the time with um, 
Emily Nolan, she was a hard taskmaster. And I said, I want to get stronger and everything like that. And she got me doing a, like a circuit workout and it was intense and it was hard. And I was like doing exercises of crying because it's hurting so much. And she's just like, get through it, get through it. And I'm like, can't see the end. And I'd never been in that much pain before, uh, that much disbelief in myself. Uh, everything was, cry I was crying, I was hurting. I was like, and then it was over. And she goes, oh, you're going to do that next week. And I was like, no. Like, but the first time of doing that, I was like, well, this is the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. Um, and then it's different to then on water. On water, it, it's different again. Um, Renee had me doing some step work last year. And I remember getting off and going, I'm never doing that again. <laughs> and just that was it. <laughs> it was um, quite a few minutes. I think they were 12 minute pieces. And I think I had, uh, I think I had four, four of them to do. But they were so intense. Like I had to sit on certain splits and certain rates and just for and it was like so many minutes each time and they used to build up and build up and build up and oh my goodness the lactic acid in the body oh it was horrid <laughs> I love how like vivid that is you can still you know feel it when you think about it yeah no I was like I'm never doing that again <laughs> oh, we always It'll say that do it then, again, then the next week yeah yep. <laughs> yeah yeah exactly I'm like, oh, shiver. look Kat it's it's been absolutely awesome chatting to you and, and reminiscing um, about your career and, and hearing some of your insights and you know like I've said a couple of times through the in interview you're you're an inspiration and a role model and I think it's been perfect um, not only to talk to you I guess a year to go to the Tokyo Paralympic Games um, but also for my last episode of Get Cooked uh, for the year so thank you so much for joining me and we wish you all the very best uh, as you lead up to the Tokyo Paralympic Games in just under 12 months' time. Thank you, Sarah. It's been very exciting. And, you know, watch this space. Absolutely. We'll be following. All the best, Kat. Thank you. Thank you.